in this chat we're going to address the common misconceptions involved with some ancient text discovered and translated and uh, the subsequent doctrines that have come out of them okay we're going to read this from biologos.org this is gilgamesh atrahasis and the flood the biblical flood story genesis 6 through 9 has certainly taken a beating over the last two or three centuries the problems began once geologists realized that a literal submersion was contradicted by clear scientific evidence and now this right here <laughs> i mean it's really a bold-faced lie total misinterpretation of things the key word right here is realized look it up so then in the beginning of the 19th century archaeologists found other flood stories from israel's neighbors that looked a lot like Genesis and were much older. Looked a lot like Genesis. That's like saying a cow looks like a horse. But we'll get into that. Maybe the biblical story is just a plagiarized version of these older stories. And you wouldn't believe how many people actually believe that. Alright. First of all. The much older part, find evidence. Find it. There isn't any. There's suppositions. There's appearances. There's maybes. There's guesswork involved. But no one knows how old either of these stories are. We simply don't know. We can guess from when they were written. But we don't know how old they are. And that's a key problem in this whole discussion. Continuing on. The scientific issues were addressed on this blog several months ago in a series of posts. I'm going to focus on the theological issues raised by the other flood stories, or the older flood stories from Mesopotamia. It just goes with the assumption that they're older. And that they're from Mesopotamia. Because they were found there, and they were in Mesopotamian script doesn't mean the story came from there and that's where archaeologists and historians and all them get so confused i'll try to get into that more as we go the stories known to us as the atrahasis epic and the gilgamesh epic both include stories of a cataclysmic flood the similarities between these stories and the biblical story are well known striking and incontrovertible That's a lie. And I'll explain. All right, first let's summarize Atrahasis. The version we have probably dates to about the 17th century BC. Keyword here is probably and about. They don't know. And it is a retelling of a story that is certainly older. That is accurate. Part of this story recounts a flood. The gods, which should be lords, but 17th or 1700s and 1800s translators, equated the word lord with the word god because of Catholic practices, and so they translated lords as gods. The gods had created humans to be their slave laborers. Well, that's not what the story says, but it's close. And it goes with, with the translation. So he's accurate by the accepted English translation. And I'll explain why it's wrong later. Uh, the slaves were becoming too noisy, and this disturbed the gods. The god Enlil, which is not a name, it is a title, it's an office, decreed that humans should be destroyed in a flood. Atrahasis, through the help of the god Ea, which is also a title, not a name, escapes the wrath of Enlil by building a large boat in which to save humanity. Some scholars argue that noise suggests rebellion against the gods and their forced labor. Humans failed to respect blah, 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 blah. Okay, but here, this right here, 
suggests. They're guessing. Do you follow along here? The Gilgamesh epic is named after its main character, Gilgamesh, which isn't a good translation, but it's what everyone knows it as. A king of the Sumerian city of Uruk. Now, that should say Shinar, not Sumer. Everyone knows that Sumer was the inappropriate translation of the letters. It should say Shinar, which means land of the two rivers. Or of the two rivers. Okay? Uruk. Let's see if I can show you something here. If I can find it. Um, let's see here. Right here. Here we go. Kurukshetra. It's in India. Shetra means region. Are you seeing what's right here? Uruk. Okay, and that's just a hint if you want to learn stuff for yourself. So we don't know that it was a Sumerian city. We don't even know if the story takes place in Sumer of Babylon, right? The Middle East. We don't know where Uruk is. But we do know that there was a tablet found in Babylon talking about a city called Uruk. And they assume that that means that city is Uruk. But what did I just show you here? Predating that is Kurukshetra, which is the region of the land of Uruk. Something like that. It's hard to... <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Kshetra means region. Uruk is in there. It's region of Uruk. Properly translated. Look, look. Kshetra. Now look at Kurukshetra. It's Kshetra with Uruk in it. You do the same thing with a lot of German words. You split them around the sentence. It's not uncommon. This is the region called Uruk. Far predates anything in Sumer. Now, let's continue. Um... Gilgamesh was, is supposed to be a historical figure who ruled sometime between 2800 and 2500 BC. These dates were chosen to fit in the appropriate evolutionary timeline. It is pretty close to the actual timeline, but really it's not possible from what empirical evidence we have to determine when he ruled you can make a guess but that guess is based on current paradigms and theories so other suppositions and presuppositions and assumptions go into determining this date okay no one knows so there's obvious changes that have happened in gilgamesh um they think the story of Gilgamesh was adopted from Atrahasis. Adapting older stories is an important point for us to keep in mind as we think of the biblical flood story. Okay. The authors of Gilgamesh and Atrahasis, not to mention the Enuma Elish, which is a more important work, all transformed older Sumerian stories for their own time and purposes. <clears throat> Yes, they did. Absolutely. Now they skip the obvious conclusion there and then they say this same pattern is at work in the biblical flood story. The biblical story is also a reworking of older well-known themes for a fresh purpose. Well, yeah. Sure. But. The authors of Gilgamesh, Atrahasis, and Enuma Elish, which are all creation epics, that's what they're called anyway, all transformed older Sumerian stories for their own times and purposes. Now, I already explained that we don't know 
if they are from the region that we all call Sumer. They were found there in that script, but that doesn't mean the stories came from there. But what they're saying is they were used there for their own purposes. And so what we should know is that those texts were altered from the original story. And so why would we base doctrine and our own worldview on something that we know was altered from the original? Think about that. But the whole effort is to prove that the Bible is not important. Okay? And if we can show that, look, these were changed from something else, which we don't have. Well, and this has a similar story, so this is just based on those, and it's just a later rendition for a new purpose. Okay. Let me say it this way. Gilgamesh was a historical account, and it is recorded and gives us a lot of information into what happened because of Genesis 6 and um, the whole issues with Ham, right? Gilgamesh was one-third deity. How do you become one-third genetically? One-third. You have a father and a mother and a god? How do the alleles work? How, how, did, how do you get X, 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 Y, and something else? How do you become one-third god? Well, the Atrahasis, the Gilgamesh epic, and the Enuma Elish explain how. And it's not creation of humans. <laughs> it's not creation. It's cloning. That's how you become one third. You have a father donating essence. You have a mother donating the womb, which provides the uh, complementary chromosomes. And you have another being donating uh, the X, Y chromosomes. So your father is not human. Your mother may or may not be human. And your patrilineage human father is where you get your XY chromosomes. If you can understand that. <sighs> okay. All right. So here we go. Here's the similarities. A flood and building a huge boat by divine command. The divine command came from different individuals. The boat has different designs and sizes. The flood is in different locations within different borders. Goes from and lands to a different place. And they are all at different times. Pitch is used to seal the boat. Well, that's not a shocker. When hasn't that been used on wooden boats? Uh, the boat is built to precise dimensions. Oh, whoa, the biblical boat is much larger. Yeah, it is. And it's a different shape and it's used for different uh, types of waters. Clean and unclean animals come on board. Now, many of you might not understand. Clean means edible. Of the four original um, categories that were created. Not clones, not domesticated, hybridized, mutated animals. No meat eaters. Um, no bottom feeders. Animals that exist in a clean environment that were created for a perfect world. That's what clean animals are. You eat those. They're good for you. Unclean animals is everything else. Things that were never created, but came to be through other 
actions of other beings besides the creator using the creator's clean animals okay this is from hybridization this is from sin a noah figure and his family are saved well that's that's stupid a noah figure and his family are saved I mean, you're stretching. You're really stretching. The stories of Noah and Utnapishtim aren't even similar. Not even close. In fact, Noah is called perfect in his genealogy. Utnapishtim is a demigod. He's a son of a fallen angel. Noah was perfect in his genealogy from Adam. Or, if you're a a uh, person listening from a Hindu background, the Atma. Noah was perfect in his genetics from Atma, from Adam, the perfect created clean man, right? Utnapishtim was the son of a fallen angel, which makes him unclean. You understand? They're not the same. Okay? And even in this, the Gilgamesh epic, the 11th tablet of the 12 tablets with the flood account, has more than the other two stories. So you're starting to see that the differences might be small, but you have to realize that they're talking about different events. The boat comes to rest on a mountain. Oh, that's ridiculous. Where it says it came to rest on the mountains of Ararat in Genesis, it actually doesn't say mountains of Ararat. That's a terrible translation. I mean, if you're tra if you're talking geology, it doesn't mean mountain. So that's one misconception given to us by the Catholics and the Jews. A raven and doves were sent out. Well, there's a reason for that. Well, Gilgamesh includes a swallow. Well, that could be a, a translation issue. Like I said, 17th and 1800s. They didn't uh, understand things quite well. And English has changed since then. A lot. But anyway, you see differences. Animals will fear humans. That's a recurring theme. That's that's in a lot of places. So that's not even... That shouldn't even be included as things that link these three. Because that's in a lot of things. Uh, the deity... Deities. Smell the pleasing aroma of the sacrifices afterward. Sure. Of course they do. Why not? What does that have to do with anything? That happens all the time in ancient texts. It does not link these three. A sign of an oath is given. Well, oaths are given all over the freaking place. All over the freaking place. And if you look in Genesis, or uh, the book of Enoch, an oath was given by the angels, as we call them, who all made a covenant with each other to go down to the daughters of Earth, or the daughters of Adam, the daughters of Atma, to make babies with them. So oaths are common. That's not a linking thing. So these three things right here don't link anything. If you want to see if you're close to land, this is just common sense for a sailor. Noah figure is inaccurate the numbers of who were saved on the boats is different the boats are completely different the floods are completely different and pitch was used on every wooden boat so are you starting to see why this argument starts to break down i hope you're starting to see this but these similarities suggest that the three stories are related in some way Let me, let me give you a hint. Here's how they're related. You ready? Ready? 
They were all written stories. That's how they're related. That's it. They're written stories. That's how they're related. Everything else speaks of totally different stories. Okay? <laughs> now, I want to see if I can actually read... Um, the Babylonian epic of the Enuma Elish. Now, where would I have that? Research. Um, where would I have put it? Oh. Hmm. I'm gonna pause the video and find it. Okay, here we go. As you see, I have here a copy of the Atrahasis. Okay, I have a cop copy of the Enuma Elish. I have a copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh. I have read these many times in many different translations. And I've even tried to get into understanding the so-called Sumerian script. Just to let you know, I'm not making stuff up. I'm not speaking from ignorance or from only a conceptual uh, perspective. This is based on actually reading the documents. All right, the Enuma Elish, right? And right off the top, what they try to tell you is the gods of the Enuma Elish are called Apsu, Tiamat, Lamu, Lahamu, and Sharkishar, Anu, Ia, and Marduk. Well, if you know anything about history, if you've read the real research from real scholars, not talking heads and parrots, you understand that Apsu and Tiamat are not individual people. Neither are Lamu and Lahamu. You can argue for Anshar and Kishar, Anu, Ia, and Marduk. But the problem is Anu, Ia, and Marduk are also titles of lordship, kind of like king, bishop, baron, right anu is also uh abyss right so the bible talks about waters above and waters below and the flood was not caused by 40 days of rain for those of you who think that the bible account is stupid because the world wouldn't flood from 40 days of rain right that's not what the bible says it says it flooded and it rained for 40 days the water came from the waters above and the waters below, and it rained. Here you have Apsu, it's fresh water. Tiamat is salt water. Based on the letters used to write the words, right? They try to break it down like they try to break down Hebrew. Anu, they say, means sky. But if you look it up in other languages, you start to realize that it has more to do with blood and abyss than it does sky. And I'm not going to go into that right now. Ia, right? It basically means Lord. Lord of the land is Enki. Lord of the air is Enlil. Right? But they try to tell you that these are gods when the texts never say that, ever, not once. And here's how it starts in the English translation. When on high, the heaven had not been named. Firm ground below 
had not been called by name. Does that say in the beginning? No. The heaven already exists. And the firm ground already exists. It just hasn't been named. Nothing but primordial Apsu, which is the abyss, from which they were begotten, and Mother Tiamat, who bore them all, right? So what do we see up here? Tiamat and salt water. All right, what does the Bible say about creating the animals in the sea? All right, so this is giving you a time frame and you know the time frame because this is being specific to a certain point in Genesis. Okay. No read hut, I should say hut, not but. No reed hut had been matted. No marshland appeared. Well, if no reed hut has been matted, that means there's no people living in them. No marshland had appeared, which means no no lands were flooded. All right, marsh comes from land being superseded by water content or water receding and leaving behind stagnant water. So none of that had happened yet. When no lords, whatever, had been brought into being, which just goes to signify that these gods were brought into being later, thus destroying your whole concept that Enki and Yahweh are the same. They're not the same. Where does it ever say in any text that Yahweh was brought into being. It doesn't. But the Sumerian gods were brought into being. Unnamed, their destinies yet undetermined. Then it was that the lords were emerged from within them. From within who? From within the abyss and the salt water, which is probably the waters below. Lamu and Lahamu came forth and were called by name. And if you need to know, I would say that's sun and moon. And that would be day four in the Genesis account. Before they had grown in age and statue. Anshar and Kishar were shaped more mighty than the others. What does it say Anshar and Kishar are? It doesn't tell us. Hmm, that's weird. Why doesn't it tell us? Huh. They just don't want us to know. They don't know what these words mean. Right? Lamu and Lahamu and Anshar and Kishar. That's why they're not translated. They extended the days, added on the years. So they had a calendar. Okay. Anu was their heir, rival of his father. Huh. Interesting. What do we see in the Bible that has to do with that? Well, you have one of the angels of God who was more wise than the rest and all that and rebelled and was kicked off the mountain because he caused Tohu and Bohu in Genesis 1-2. He caused darkness and lifelessness. Right? Will that make him a rival of his father? Verily, Anu, Anshar's firstborn, was his equal. Oh, wow. That's crazy. They're saying the son is equal to the father. But he's a rival of his father. Wow. Hmm. And thus you have an account of those who serve the day star. The dragon. Satan. The great serpent of old. Boom. Right there. Just in case you didn't know. That's what this is talking about. 
a new sired his image nudie mood that's enki this nudie mood was the master of his father huh of broad wisdom understanding mighty in strength mightier by far than his grandfather and Shar. and you have to understand this concept father grandfather mother when you're talking about divine beings you're not talking about sexual procreation okay but you see right here this right here the son was master of his father you see that also in the book of revelation and the book of daniel where it talks about the son of satan being given all of his father's power and authority Do you understand that? This this concept is in the Bible. Oh, the divine brothers got together. Wow, they banded together. Where do we see that? We see that in Enoch. They disturbed Tiamat as they rushed here and there. Indeed, they distraught and tormented Tiamat by their boisterous mirth in the dwelling of heaven. Apsu could not diminish their clamor. And Tiamat was dumbfounded at their ways. Their doings were loathsome to him. Offensive and overbearing were their ways. So what, what are they doing? They're doing evil. Okay. To put it in modern terms. Oh, and then they had some talks and they said they're doing terrible things. And she's like, oh, when? And they're like, oh, let's do something about it. And uh, there was some rudeness and disrespect going on. And then destroy my father, their rebellious ways, All right, is the advice given. When Apsu, which is the Abyss, heard this, his face grew luminous. Huh. What do we see in Genesis 1-5? And God said, let there be light. Wow. And the Abyss was filled with light. This is not talking about a person. <laughs> it's an anthropomorphized account of what you might call cosmic events. Do you understand that? Are you following along? Here we have Genesis 1, 3. And God said, let there be light. Then they gave their decision to the lords. The lords were astonished, lapsed into silence. You also see that happening in the book of Enoch when God tells um, the angels what to do about the sons of the angels that had come down. They have the same thing. They're astonished. They lapse into silence. Okay. Now look. Here's how you know it's this tablet, this document is coming from the other side. The side in opposition to Yahweh. Okay. Superior in wisdom, accomplished and resourceful, Ea, the all-wise, saw through their design. And that's Nudimud. Okay. That's the same guy. That's how you know Ea isn't a name. It's a title. And I'll show you some more later so you can understand. So the hero of the story is Ea and Marduk. All right. Two different guys, but those are the heroes. Heroes, um, And they're just going to say he's better than, than God. He's better than the abyss. He's better than the timelessness. He's better than the law that establishes um, physical properties. He's better than all of this. He made artful his spell against it. What do you have in the word Nakash in Genesis chapter 3? Nakash, a whisperer, a conjurer, a sorcerer. Hmm, interesting. He is also the serpent god. Wow, ah, interesting. Hmm. 
He made artful his spell against it, surpassing and holy. He recited it and made it subsist in the deep. As he poured sleep upon him, sound asleep he lay. When he had made Absu lie prone deep in sleep, Mumu the advisor was powerless to stir. He loosened Absu's band. Hmm. Tore off his tiara. Now what? remember, Absu is the deep. There's the waters above and the waters below. He loosened the band, tore off his tiara, removed his halo, and put it on himself. Having constrained Apsu, he slew him. Mumu he bound and locked, having thus upon Apsu established his ascendance. He laid hold of Mumu, holding him by the nose rope. After Ia had vanquished and tramped down his foes, which is the laws of nature, had assured his triumph over his enemies, which was order and life. In profound peace, he rested in his sacred chamber, which was Mount Meru, the mountain of God. He named it Apsu. So now he's calling his temple, his house, the name of what he slew. So, from everything that Ia goes into his Apsu, you have to understand he's going into his house. He's not going into the concept of the deep. Uh, he founded his cult in that same place. Ea and Damkina, his wife, dwelled there in splendor, in the Chamber of Fates, the House of Destinies. A god was engendered. And they made Marduk. Boom. Okay. His father was Ea. Alright. So now you see that people have completely mistranslated this. It's just mistranslated. And it's misunderstood because we speak a different language than the English that was spoken when these were translated. Do you understand? Our English is different from the English 200 years ago. We don't use the words the same way. But if you actually look at what it actually says, you understand this isn't an epic of creation. This is an accounting based on a time period, which is what all this is. A time period. An argument. Right? Right? And a rebellion. That's what this is saying. And a destruction of order. And natural law. That's what this is saying. So this story right here is talking about what caused Genesis 1-2. Okay, now if you don't know, the Bible says very clearly that God did not create the heaven and the earth desolate and without life. The way Genesis is translated, it says in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was formless and void, which the words are tohu and bohu, and it means desolate and without life. So if God didn't create the earth desolate and without life. And by Genesis 1-2, the earth is desolate and without life. That means Genesis 1-1 is talking about what happened before Genesis 1-2, as you would expect. And the word translated was, in Old English, was, was the same thing that we now call became. You understand? Back then, was worked. Now, it doesn't work. We don't use it the same way. We use the word became. So Genesis 1-2 in modern English should say, And then the earth became desolate and without life. Now, if you're on the same page, you understand that this story in the Enuma Elish is talking about how the earth became desolate and without life. It's not in contradiction to the Bible whatsoever. Uh, 
All right. And then based on what version you're reading, it talks about how either Marduk or Enki became the heroes. Um, I wanted to show you. Oh. Okay. I think it's right up in here. Well, several gods made an attempt to destroy Tiamat, which is the salt waters. <laughs> right? So they're trying to destroy the ocean. It's like, uh, okay. Um, where is it? Da, 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 da. All right, here we go. Here's some examples. They'd select, in this account, they select Marduk to be the hero. Right here you say, um, You, Marduk, are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your word is anew. Let's see here. Hmm, let's back up a little bit. All right, wait, wait, wait. They erected for him an ample throne. He sat down on it, facing his fathers, presiding. Presiding means taking authority. You are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your command is anew. And what did I tell you about the word anew? It has to do with blood and abyss. So your command is bond. Your word is bond, basically. <laughs> you, Marduk, are the most honored of the great gods. Your decree is unrivaled. Your word is anew. From this day unchangeable shall be your pronouncement. To raise or bring low, these shall be in your hand. Your utterance shall be true. Your command shall be unimpeachable. No one among the gods shall transgress your bounds. Let the place of their shrines be ever in your place. Marduk, you are our avenger. We've granted you kingship over the entire universe. That's wrong. That concept didn't exist. Or it should be cosmos, which means everything on earth. Your word shall be supreme when you sit in assembly. Your weapons shall not fail. All right. Um, be good to those who support you trash those who don't support you they address themselves to marduk their firstborn wow all the gods are his parents apparently like are you starting to see that this is not saying what you think it's saying when you read it in english how did he become supreme among all the gods well they put him on a throne and they said so does that make it so? Think about that. Anyway, the story goes on to say that, um, and it might be in the Atrahasis, but the gods gave him their, their names. They gave him their names. And how do you give someone your name? Well, it's because... Their names aren't names the way we say name, right? They're titles. Like the word uncle is a title. The word king is a title. The word judge is a title. Okay? They gave Marduk their titles of authority. They gave him their authority so that he could be their avenger. You understand? So that's how you know that these so-called names of the gods aren't names. They're titles that can be transferred. Okay, so he fights Tiamat, destroys Tiamat, which once again is supposed to be the salt waters. So the waters below, most likely, right? Oh, here we go again. Conferring upon him the rank of a new. 
Yeah, they actually translated that one better. I'm surprised they didn't say name. Um, uses magic against the natural order. And splits her apart and da 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 da. Okay. Now, we get to this part. Uh, he establishes his own calendar. Okay. We see up here in the beginning, way up here, a calendar existed. And we know when this story occurred based on the calendar that existed. And it happens to match the account in Genesis. And you can only understand this if you have the calendar of Genesis. Okay? And then you go all the way down here. And you see, you see him setting up his own calendar. Okay? Um, da, da, da. So he's... he's um, Successful in defeating the natural order. Divides the natural order and does artful works. It's kind of like what science does right now, right? CERN and, and whatnot. He split her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he sat up as the ceiling of the sky. He pulled down the bar and posted guards. He ordered them not to allow her waters to escape. He crossed the heavens and surveyed the regions. Okay, this is heaven. Has always meant sky up until recently. Okay, now sky means air up until recently. So what you have right here is an early account of Sumerian cosmology that has a flat earth with waters above and waters below. It's right here, right there. Nobody sees it. Um... So anyway, he crossed the heavens, surveyed the regions. He's doing surveying, right? He squared Apsu's quarter, the abode of Nudimud or Enki, as the Lord measured the dimensions of the deep. So yeah, I thought Apsu was a god. How is he measuring the dimensions of Apsu? Well, Apsu's not a god. So all that introduction part where that's a god. And all that translation that calls Apsu a god, it's not a god. It's a natural law. Okay. Um, stuff they don't understand, they didn't translate. They don't understand this cosmology. They don't understand Genesis. They don't understand how anything exists. So they don't know how to translate these words. They don't understand half of these sentences. All these people say, this is just a retelling of Genesis. Have them explain sentence by sentence to you. They can't. He constructed stations for the gods, aligning their astral likenesses as constellations. He determined the year by assigning the zones. He set up three constellations for each of the 12 months. After defining the days of the years by means of these astrological figures that he determined, he founded the station of Nibiru. Oh, interesting. Huh, there goes all of that modern nonsense about Nibiru. <laughs> Wow, if you just read the text. Alongside it, he set up the stations of Enlil and Ea. Having opened up the gates on both sides. Now, if you don't understand this kind of talk, go read the book of Enoch. It uses the same words in the book of Enoch. Because the book of Enoch was a story from the same time period. Very close, anyway, within hundreds of years. He strengthened the locks to the left and the right. So he's creating his own calendar and establishing how to judge his calendar by the sun, the moon, and the stars. Okay, back then, there were no planets. They didn't exist in anybody's thinking. 
There was earth, sun, moon, and stars. So anybody that talks about Sumerians and their planets and da-da-da, they didn't exist. They were not a concept. Period. The cosmos was everything under the firmament. Everything on earth. Above that was the waters above. Below it is the waters below. And earth is above the waters below and is fed by the waters below. And up until the flood of Noah, the waters above stayed above. Okay. That's the cosmology that all these ancient writers just know. They don't believe it. They know it. Okay. Um, let's see here. Interesting thing right here. It talks about how he did all this stuff, assigned what astronomical elements pertain to what part of his calendar, right? And then it says the moon he caused to shine the night he entrusted to the moon. Okay. Um, he appointed the moon a being of the night to signify the days. Huh. Monthly, without seas, from designs with a crown, at the month's very start, rising over the land, you will have luminous horns to signify six days. So it's talking about the, um, the moon cycle. On the seventh day, that full moon, blah, 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 blah. At the time of disappearance, you will approach the course of the sun. And on the 29th day, you stand in opposition to the sun. Okay, so he's saying, he's telling us when his year begins, right? The Yah calendar has a similar uh, gate so that you can understand when the year begins, which is usually in March or April, depending on how the uh, pagan calendar compares to it. The first month is usually in March or April. And so this is telling you kind of a similar thing. But this is saying um, that every month it's going to look like this on the 29th day. This doesn't mean the calendar only had 29 days. <laughs> People go that route. They say, wow, see, it says 29th day. Well, that doesn't mean it only had 29 days. They just assume. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, so they destroyed somebody called Kingu or somebody or something blaming things on him, right? Remember, they rebelled against Tiamat and they say King who caused Tiamat to rebel. But what did they say above? They rebelled against Tiamat. So they're flipping the script. They imposed on him guilt and severed his blood vessels. Out of his blood, they fashioned who man kind, which is kind of an interesting thing. When you look at where the word human came from, Hugh is actually a Mongolian god from whom all mankind was created in their story. Now, Hugh is a god. Man is Adam. Kind is kind, right? Now, what's interesting here is that the translators translated this as humankind, which means demigods. Hmm. And I think they're more accurate than you want to understand. This isn't talking about creating the children of Adam. This is talking about creating mutated children of Adam. Let's see. Out of his blood, they fashioned people. And he made them work for the gods. Wow. The gods were working? And they needed to be freed. Some gods, right? 
you start to notice things in here. The gods were rebelling against natural order and they didn't want to do their job anymore. So they had some clones made to do their job. This is a story of the fallen angels. Are you following me? Okay. Now, in the Atrahasis, I'm going to load that up now. You see some different details. Um, blah, blah, blah. All right. Yep. This is good. When the gods, instead of man, did the work, bore the loads, the gods' load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. The great Anunnaki, which means children of the blood of the abyss. Okay. That's literally what it means. But it means children of Anu. Blood and abyss and all that is in there. The great Anunnaki made the Igigi, that's the Watchers, from Enoch, okay? That's the Bnei Ha'elohim who took unto them daughters of men from Genesis 6. Same people. Uh, they did extra work. Anu, their father, was king. So you have someone here titled after a concept of Anu. Anu is a title, not a name. Their counselor, warrior, Elil, which is Enlil, which is the lord of the air. Their chamberlain was Ninurta, who is a very able aerial combatant. He's very good with his airship and shooting other people down. And he's pretty accurate with his air bombing as well, according to the texts. Their canal controller, Enugi. Okay. And what do we know about the foundation of Egypt. Osiris dug the canals and tamed the mighty river and made Egypt possible. All right. Just to give you some framework here. Uh, they, they cast the lots to make divisions. A new, well, this is weird. Okay. I thought a new was their king, but they cast lots to determine where people are going. And Anu was equally in the lots there. So what you have here is a description of angelic administration. They're all equals under the Most High, under the one on the throne, under uh, the controller angel, under the word, under the creator. It's a chain of command. And these are the worker, worker angels. These are the Terra angels, okay? Hope you can understand. They cast lots. Anu went to the sky. and Enlil took the earth for his people. Um, there's some breaks in, this, in the text. So you have to kind of just go along and just skip in, incomplete thoughts. Okay. Uh, the bolt which bars the sea was assigned to farsighted Enki. The bolt which bars the sea was assigned to farsighted Enki. Which is a very interesting statement that you have no idea what it means unless you understand the calendar of Yah. Can I explain it right now? Not completely, so I'm not even going to start. Okay. When Anu had gone up to the sky and the gods of the abyss had gone below, the Anunnaki of the sky made the watchers bear the workload. Oh, oh, you see what's happening here? It's talking about injustice. So the king goes up to the sky. The gods of the abyss go down to the abyss. And the Anunnaki, who are supposed to be working with the Igigi, remember? Up here. When the gods instead of man did the work, bore the load. Okay, so they're all supposed to be doing it together. Well, they made the Igigi do all the work. 
They dug canals, cleared channels. Why are they doing all this? Well, they're creating a city-state. Okay? They're creating an empire. So the gods dug out the Tigris River, which is probably not what the that says. I'll just skip that. Same with Euphrates. Uh, in the deep, they set up the abyss of the land. Inside it raised its top. Of all the mountains, they were counting the years of loads. Now, this makes no sense if you don't understand ancient cosmology. All right, they set up the Apsu of the land. Inside it raised its top. Like, what? It's not talking about what you think it's talking about. We're just going to skip that because I want to get to something here. Um, they started complaining about the work. So they sent an ambassador who said, um, let's all rebel. And so they decided to take up arms. They took their pickaxes and stuff and shovels and they went to make war against Enlil. Um, when they reached the gate of Enlil's dwelling, it was night, the middle watch. The house was surrounded. Enlil did not know they were there. Okay. Um, but the watchman noticed and raised the alarm. Okay. They listened to all the uproar made by the rebels. And they got Enlil up and said, hey, check this out. There's people out here with weapons. So Enlil had weapons brought in. And he spoke and said, you know, set up defenses. So the guy set up defenses. And so the watchman says, uh, Enlil, why do you look afraid? Why are you afraid of your own sons? Again, not referring to like father who had a baby and is his son. This is different. This is the actual meaning of son. Right? And if you can understand this, then you can understand Genesis 6 much better. Oh, Enlil, your face is fearful. Why are you afraid? It's repeated, meaning it's important. Okay? In, in the ancient text, when they repeated the exact same phrase, it meant pay attention and understand this concept. Enlil was afraid. Meaning Enlil is not God. <laughs> okay. Um, send for a new to be brought down. So now they're going to ask for the king to come back from the sky. Because the workers don't want to do the work right. And now they're threatening the order that they all established by casting lots. Because they didn't want to work anymore. Okay. Do you understand what's happening here? Injustice begets injustice. Begets violence. That's what happened with the angels before Genesis 1-2. So Anu comes down, da-da-da-da-da, and he said, wow, is it against me that they're, they're coming again in battle? You know? And he's like, okay, you know what? Go meet them in battle, blah, 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 blah. And then skipping forward here, um, they, they actually finally listen to the complaints of the workers and they're like, we're freaking tired of this. It's, it's too much. No, no, no. And, and Enlil starts crying because he finally listened to the complaints. All right. Um, and he's like, why should we kill them? They, their work was too hard. <laughs> You know, it's like, so he's, he's starting to see some here. And anyway, they make a deal and it's right here. Um, it is right here. They, they have a little meeting with the leaders of the rebels and the leaders of the leaders. And he said, um, there is Belet Eli, the womb goddess. What's a womb goddess? What do we call that in modern day? You know, the woman that helps a woman give birth. What do we call that? 
Well, back then, it's womb goddess. Um, let her create primeval man. Hmm. So that he may bear the yoke. So that he may bear the yoke. Let man bear the load of the gods. Bella to Ili, the womb goddess, is present. Let the womb goddess create offspring. And let man bear the load of the gods. Does that sound just to you? When Genesis says God created the heaven and the earth, and then Genesis 1-2 happened, and then he fixed everything up, but under a time restriction. That's what most people don't understand. He added a time restriction. It's a countdown clock that has entropy in it. Okay. And, um, and then he put Adam in a garden in the east in Eden. Very specific. Very specific. Right. But Adam had all the good things. And he didn't have to work. So this is not the same story. Because this is saying they're going to create mankind to do the work. Are you paying attention? Um, so the woman, the, the woman says, oh, I can't do this. This is Enki's job. He makes everything better than I do. Uh, if he gives me clay, then I will do it. Hmm. What is, what is clay? It's mire. It's a building block. With clay, you can create clones. Okay. Enki made his voice heard, da-da-da. On the 1st, 7th, and 15th of the month, I will do this stuff. It's all very scientific. And then we'll mix clay with flesh and blood. Huh. Well, so the flesh and the blood already exist. The clay already exists. Then a god and a man will be mixed together in clay. Well, that's interesting. I thought they said they were going to make primeval man. But they're going to mix a god and a man together in a carrier, which is the clay. Hmm. Let us hear the drum beat forever after. Let a ghost come into existence from the God's flesh and let the ghost exist so that we never forget the slain God from which they got the essence that they were going to mix into the clay with the essence of man. Okay. So they're saying that you have to sacrifice one of your own and we'll take his essence. We'll mix it together with the man's DNA. We'll put it in a clay. We'll do all this first 15th and seventh of it each month. We'll do all the scientific stuff. And as a remembrance, your spirit will haunt us forever. Okay? You understand? This is not talking about creating man from nothing. This is talking about cloning in a lab. Okay. They agreed. Uh, they killed him. They took his essence. And a ghost came into existence. And what does Enoch talk about? The children of the Watchers, who were hybrids of some kind, however they came into being, whether it was from some kind of sexual procreation or some kind of scientific wizardry or through some kind of spiritual procreation. It's not really detailed in ways that any of us can understand with our current level of understanding. But whatever way, the Watchers made children with women of Earth. And Enoch says that when those children of the Watchers die, since they have the essence of angels, they are immortal, but they have the body of Adam, so they will die. So what's going to happen is they're going to be restless spirits on the earth, always hungry, but never able to eat, always thirsty, but never able to drink. And what do you think happens to a mind when it's constantly in that state? You go a little bit psycho. So yeah, they become worse than they were when they were in the flesh. Okay? That's where we get demons. And this is talking about how they made a demon. Okay? So they killed the guy. He became a spirit. They took his essence, mixed it in the clay, uh, spat spittle on the clay, which is interesting because that has 
her material in it. Okay. Um, I have carried out perfectly the work that you ordered of me. She's not creating anything. She's mixing things. Do you understand the difference? Okay. Because, <laughs> well, technically it is creating. Because the word create doesn't mean from nothing. It really doesn't. It never has. It's a myth that it means that. It has never meant that. Because there simply never has been anything that you would call out of that concept. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created it from himself, not from nothing. When he remade the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, 3 on, it was from himself and from the earth that he had already created. There has never been anything made from nothing. Not once, not ever. So the word create doesn't mean from nothing. But I know most of you, because of the Jews, like literally Jewish rabbis came up with this. Because of a couple Jewish rabbis who were very convincing for the last couple hundred years, most people in the Christian world have been taught that created means from nothing. But it doesn't, and it never has. It means from something. It means fashioned. And if you don't believe me, look at how the word bara is used in in the Bible and try to figure out how in the world that could mean from nothing. Put it in context. You'll see that it doesn't work. And if it doesn't work in every other place in the Bible, then it doesn't work in Genesis. You understand? <laughs> okay. So she did a process, mixed things together. Okay. And then says, I bestow on you the noise of mankind. I have undone the fetter and granted freedom. And they, they, you know, their anxiety went down. They worshipped her, which means, you know, attributed worth. Give honor to whom honor. That whole concept, right? And then they changed her name, which means they changed her title to Mother Goddess. Um, Enki and Manny went into the room of fate. Oh, that's interesting. The womb goddesses were assembled. Wow, okay, now there's more than one womb goddess. Okay, they were assembled. He trod the clay in her presence. She kept reciting an incantation. <laughs> For Enki, staying in her presence, made her recite it. All right, what do you think is happening there? He's working the clay. She's reading instructions. When she had finished reading the instructions, she pinched off 14 pieces of clay and set seven pieces on the right, seven on the left. Between them, she put down a mud brick. She made use of blank, missing text. A reed opened it to cut the umbilical cord, called up the wise and knowledgeable womb goddesses, seven and seven, seven created males, seven created females. Do you understand? Okay. It's a C-section. They didn't create anything. The babies were grown in their wombs. They had wombs, which means they're daughters of Adam. They, they had a C-section because you couldn't natural birth those monsters, okay? <clears throat> and he led them two by two in their presence, right? Because if they can get two that can mate, then they don't have to do this process anymore, right? So they made seven trial runs. Seven males, seven females, paired them up. Um, let's see here. Da, da, da. And then they give rules for how how the uh, procreation of the clones is going to work, all right, and, and all that stuff. When they can make babies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they they have a scientific process to test their work. 
Okay. When the tenth month came, she slipped in a staff and opened the womb. There you go, C-section. She covered her head. Well, what do doctors do when they open someone up? Okay. Performed the midwifery. Put on her belt. Said a blessing. So basically, she she's getting ready for surgery here. She made a drawing in flour and put down a mud brick. My hands have created it, she says. Okay. But not from nothing. She's like, check it out. The science project worked. Read in context, you start to understand that this is not even close to Genesis. Now, moving along. 600 years, the clones became too numerous. The country was as noisy as a bellowing bull. And you remember at the very beginning of the story of the Enuma Elish, the gods were riotous and loud and clamorous. Their, <laughs> their offspring clone army <laughs> is just like them. What a shocker. Genetic inheritance. Holy cow. Enlil's like, they're too much. I can't, I can't deal with this. Just cut off their food supply and they'll die from hunger. Uh, <clears throat> and here you have some of the first forms of um, weather modification. Let him wipe away his rain. Let no flood water flow from the springs. Uh, let the wind go, go. Let it strip the ground bare. So he's basically like, cut off their water. Let the wind rage. Cover it with clouds so they don't get any sun. He's basically saying, no light, no water, and constant wind to blow everything away. He's like, make it a dust bowl. So that's weather, weather modification 101 right there. It's the first account of it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, basically he's like hoping they all die. Enki intervenes. So they send more problems. Enki intervenes again. Da 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 da. Um, and then basically that continues over and over. Uh, the people end up more numerous than they were before because that's how population management works. I mean, if you look at wildlife management, for instance, when a predator eats too many of one type of animal, that animal will then produce more offspring than before. And then that animal eats too much of the bioeconomy of the area. And then the predators become too numerous for that animal and then begin eating that animal. And it's a co constant cycle. And you see that right here. The gods oppress the people. The people become more numerous. It's just response to environment. Okay. Da-da-da-da-da. Same story continues. Until only um, the they they had finally a really good starvation practice going on until it starts talking about cannibalism, and only one or two households were left. They were all scabbed and like melting and dying. They were just falling apart. The thoughtful man Atrahasis kept his ear open to his master Ea. Now, what you don't know from this text is that Atrahasis is Ea's son because Ea raped one of the clones. So Atrahasis is not only a demigod clone, he's also a demigod. <laughs> All right? So there you have, he's one-third god. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Okay. And Aya's like, hey, you're going to get destroyed. Um, sets up a, a plan to intercede. Tells him to make a boat. Put all these people on. Da, da, da. He floats around. Um, let's see. What am I skipping here? I'm skipping something. Um, 
Okay. And they're going to flood, right? Uh, let's see. Sorry. I haven't looked at this in a, this particular text in a while. All right. It's like, so they're talking about giving a flood. Okay. And the people blame en Enki. And he's like, did I do it? No, this is Enlil's work. So he's blaming the other god. Because he wants to be the good guy. Okay. Um, he's speaking to his half son, Atrahasis. Uh, dismantle the house, build a boat. Okay. And what does God tell Noah? He says, build a boat from this kind of wood. He doesn't say, dismantle your house and build a boat. <laughs> it's totally different. Reject possession, save living things. The boat you build, blank space. Roof it like the Apsu. Which, which is Ea's house that he named after the Apsu. You remember from the Enuma Elish? He defeated Tiamat and then ordered the Apsu and then named his house Apsu. He's like, so roof your boat like my house. Um, duh, duh, duh. Take birds, fish, which... Uh, Yeah, if I'm reading this right, he's providing fish and birds for food for the boat journey. And that is not even similar in any way to the Noah story. Totally different. So, um, anyway, they build this crappy boat that is uh, a commonly known... Middle Eastern style boat that basically looks like a giant wooden bowl. And this one was roofed to keep the sun out, right? Uh, he put wild animals on board. He put cattle on board. He put birds on board. Okay. He put his family on board. They were eating and drinking, but he went in and out. Um, let's see here. The, da, 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 he cut the rope and released the boat which the Bible says God shut up the door of the ark so you have totally different stories here it's not just the details it's the concepts involved okay um, so there's tearing at the sky making the flood which again speaks of not rain but breaking up the waters above Okay. Uh, the flood roared like a bull, like a wild ass screaming. The winds, the darkness was total. There was no sun. Um, a new went berserk. Right? This is like... Anyway. They repent of their thing and say, how could I have ordered such destruction? You know? But Enlil stayed strong with his decision because he wanted them gone. Um, let's see. Now I want to... get to... I'm trying to read real quick here. Okay. I don't like this version very much. So there's three lines missing. And then he says, Would a true father have given birth to the rolling sea? Right. So that they would clog the river like dragonflies. Clog the what? The river. Hmm. Not the earth. Okay. They are washed up like a raft on a what? On a bank. They're washed up like a raft on a bank in open country. It basically just told you the flood was in the river. The river flooded. Are you following me here? It's a very localized flood. So what I'm thinking is the clone 
clone people were kept on basically a, a peninsula or an island. At, at least, uh, you know, two or three sides surrounded by ocean and two or three sides surrounded by rivers. They flooded up the rivers and washed over the land. This is not the same as the Noah flood. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, for seven days and seven nights, the torrent, storm, and flood came on. There's a gap of 58 lines. 58 lines is missing. That's significant. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Enlil finds out that the people survived, gets really pissed at the gods and starts blaming people. And they all blame Enki. And he's like, who but Enki would do this? And Enki says, I did it in defiance of you. I preserved life. Why? Because Enki made. Enki was the the head scientist of the project for clone making he liked his creation he even raped them occasionally to make babies with them so yeah he did it he made sure his work stayed in existence okay they all get over it um and then it says um We sent a flood, but a man survived the catastrophe. So you can see right here that um, either the translation is terrible or this story isn't trying to be as specific as you might think it is. We sent the flood, but a man survived the catastrophe. Right, when you know that he had his family on the boat from her from the story, so it wasn't a man that survived. So it's just, um, and I hope you get the point. And if you know the story, if you go read Genesis, you see a completely different story. The Atrahasis, the Enuma Elish, the Epic of Gilgamesh, talk about these lords who came into being from something. They weren't creative gods. Like everyone tries to say, well, they're like the same as Jehovah. Right? Enki is Jehovah. I mean, how many times have you heard this argument? It's ridiculous. Enki is a title. Yeah. You can apply all of these titles of the gods to the creator. He's the one who gave the titles out. Do you understand? <laughs> These lords pass the titles around. And the man gods after the Noah flood stole the titles. This is all recorded in ancient texts. But what happens is people dig up these ancient texts. They know they're altered from originals. They have no idea where the stories originated or when they were written. They make guesses based on best available evidence, which is only the evidence that they think best agrees with their theories. Okay? And then they say, see, this is an older account than Genesis, and Genesis was stolen from this. But one thing you start to notice is you can't identify the timeline of these unless you have the calendar that's in Genesis. You have no idea what group of individuals is being spoken of unless you understand the account of Genesis. When did the Beneha Elohim take daughters of earth and make offspring in the Bible? Right? Because that's what this Atrahasis and Enum Elish and Epic of Gilgamesh talk about, 
where people say, see, the God's created man. The Bible is not the first thing that talks about the creation of man. But really, when you read the text, it's talking about these lords making clones from men and gods. And when did that happen in the Bible? That happened in Genesis 6. Okay. You following me here? I want to show you something else. Mount Meru is an ancient word from India, from Sanskrit, in Sindhu or Hindu mythology. Okay. A golden mountain that stands in the center of the universe and is the axis of the world. Now, what you don't understand is that's not literal and it's not based on your cosmology of a ball spinning through the heavens and shooting through the heavens around another ball with other balls spinning around. Okay. One way to say it is Mount Meru, the mountain of God, okay, is the earth as we know it. Another way to say it is, it is the administration of the angels on the earth before Genesis 1-2. Okay. Now what happened, what happened here? Well, what we have here is the churning of the cosmic ocean. The gods wanted the nectar of immortal life. So they use the serpent to shake the mountain, to churn up the sea. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying here? Now, if you can't put two and two together from, from this, then you need to read the Bible more carefully. Okay. The gods or the angels, because that's what devas and asuras are. Different angels, different groups of angels. What do we have in the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh? The the um, the Utnapishtim, the uh, Atrahasis, the all this crap, right? You have two groups of gods, two groups of angels, the Agigi, the Anunnaki, right? In the Bible, you have two groups of angels. The Watchers and the others, right? It's the same story all over the world in every language, okay? Two groups of angels and the serpent caused... The shaking of the mount and shook the waters. And what did we see in the Babylonian flood stories? We saw Marduk or Enki fighting the salt water. You remember that? Fighting Tiamat. Salt water. Shaking the ocean. Okay, you can look all this up yourself. And I wanted to go over this because when you confront things like this, that sound really smart, and I'm not disrespecting the guy that wrote this or the group that supports it or anybody that believes this. Okay, but Genesis 6 through 9 has nothing to do with Atrahasis and Gilgamesh and Enuma Elish and other texts that will soon be getting dug up and translated it has nothing to do with them. 
this wasn't based on that, wasn't based on that, wasn't based on that. They're different stories at different times and different places. Just read it. Just simply read it. Like, actually read it. Like you would read instructions on how to put together an Ikea desk. Actually read what it says. And what you were taught in church, and what you were taught in school, and what you were taught in your yogi classes, is close but not quite. Because they're telling you how to understand what you read. And even though they tell you to understand it in a way that it's not written in, you decide to believe them. And so then people come out with crap like this. Based on what the Jews and the Catholics have been teaching that Genesis talks about, I can totally understand why people would think the story of Utnapishtim is the story of Noah from an older day. I can totally understand that. But if you actually understand what you're reading, you know that they are completely different stories. And one, the main premise is Utnapishtim is a clone who is also a demigod. And Noah was perfect in his genetics from Adam. And you have a clash of concept ideology right there. So important to everything else in history that you have to know and recognize that they are not the same person and they are not even close to the same story. They are in total violation of each other. Okay? So just because stories have the same things in them doesn't mean they're the same story. Okay? That's like basically saying that, well, Cinderella has a princess in it and Snow White has a princess in it. And they both have an evil stepmother. So that means they're the same story. It's just stupid. Everyone knows they're different stories. But when you read ancient texts, you do that. And everybody says, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I guess the Bible's just stolen from the Sumerians. Now, here's the thing. The Bible was written after the Sumerian Empire was destroyed. That's in the Bible. That's information in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that the stories in the Bible are younger than the stories from Sumer. And if you can't understand that, then you need to start reiterating your concept analysis. Stories are older than civilizations and nations. Because civilizations and nations came after the flood. The stories came from before the flood. And when you can start understanding the actual timeline and actual concepts and what's actually written, you won't fall prey to stupid crap like this. Okay. Anyway, just wanted to talk about it. And I know this, a lot of this is probably going to freak out a lot of you, especially people raised in church, because you were told that if you read anything outside the Bible, you're getting into Satanism, which is totally false. Um, you want to talk about uh, the Vedic writings. They're, they're talking about the same stories that are in the Bible. And Jesus is there as well. You know, goes by the same titles, identifies himself the same way, operates under the same premises. And the Bible isn't the only time that God interacted with man. The Israelites descended from Abraham were not the only people on earth that God has ever interacted with, spoken to, or delivered. 
It even says that in the Bible. Uh, what is it? Amos chapter 9. Oh, you think Israel's special? Didn't I also bring the Philistines out of Kaftor? Right, go read it. List two nations in there that God interceded with and saved from the world system of Babylon that weren't Israel. Okay. So you need to start thinking in bigger paradigms and more exacting concepts the biblical flood story has not taken a beating the religious interpretation of the biblical flood story has taken a beating as it deserves because the religious interpretation that most christians and jews understand is totally incorrect and leads you down weird pathways of illogical, unfounded concepts that make you confused. And all those questions you have about your faith is because you don't understand Genesis. Okay? Alright. Anyway, wanted to get that out there. I've talked about this with a few people. And... People wanted me to share it on a broader basis. By no means did I go into details. I just went over concept analysis. That way when you read stuff like this. Or other ancient texts. Or scientists talking about how Sumerian texts. Blah blah blah. The Bible blah blah blah. You understand that they're not arguing with what the Bible actually says. They're not comparing the Sumerian texts to the Bible. They're comparing it and they are arguing with the religious institution translations that have been forced on the public. They're not arguing against what the Bible actually says because they don't understand what the Bible actually says because they think that what the church says it says is what it says, which is not what it says. If you don't follow me, rewind, put slow-mo, and listen to that sentence again. All right. I love you. Be blessed and bless. Go learn something and stretch your mind.